Okay, so let's talk about material and spatial descriptions of fields today. That'll be pretty much a synonym for Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions of motion. So whether you're looking at, you know, fixed in background space points or if you're following the material. Um, after this chapter in the kinematics section of the textbook, there's a few small chapters that um, have a bunch of special cases like uh, constant gradient and rigid motions and things like that. So like chapter 10, for instance, I expect you to read them and understand them, but we probably won't cover all of the special cases of motion directly in class. Um, I think we'll cover stretching and spin in arbitrary motion, and we'll cover chapters 12 and 13, and then we'll probably go on to <clears throat> material and spatial integration and um, Reynolds transport theorem, and that'll be our coverage of kinematics. The other special cases are nice like illuminating examples that might help you think of it in the more general deformation case. Um, but we won't cover them directly. I might assign some homework problems out of those sections. All right, so any scalar vector or tensor field defined on a continuum body can be described as a function of the points occupied by the body in the reference configuration just as easily as it can be described as a function of the points occupied by the body in the deformed or spatial configuration. And this is the case because we have a one-to-one -one mapping between points in the reference configuration and points in the deformed or spatial configuration, namely the deformation. So it's easy to go back and forth between the two. Let's consider a scalar field. We'll call it phi. <clears throat> well, it could take arguments of points in the reference configuration and time. But if we wanted to take points in the deformed configuration, we would just say phi of chi t inverse, the fixed time inverse of, whoopsies, uh, that should be x and t. <clears throat> and now we've described it as a, uh, a scalar field taking arguments of points in the spatial configuration instead of the reference configuration. And likewise, um, phi of x and t, one that takes arguments of points in the deformed configuration, can be made to take arguments 
of reference configuration points, chi t of x, or we could consider a vector field, maybe the velocity. So V <coughs> is equal to the time derivative of the deformation for any <coughs> material point. Well, that can also be considered the time derivative. Again, this is with respect to a fixed material point of the fixed time inverse of the deformation Now taking arguments of a spatial point and time. Let me fix a little issue I got going on with my notes here. Okay, so in that case we have that V of x in the reference configuration and t time is equal to v of the fixed time inverse of the deformation and a spatial point and time. So in other words, it's the same thing as the scalar case. We can just identify <coughs> the point in the spatial configuration with the corresponding point in the reference configuration under the deformation and vice versa. So regardless of whether we describe the vector field V, the velocity, as a function of points in the spatial configuration or points in the reference configuration, it is a spatial vector field in the sense that it describes the rate of displacement of the points of the material in the deformed configuration. So it shows it talks about how fast they're moving from where they already are in the deformed configuration. The deformation gradient, F, is a mixed tensor field in that it maps reference configuration tangent vectors, or infinitesimal displacements, to spatial or deformed configuration infinitesimal displacements. But again, we can think of it as a field either taking arguments of points in the reference configuration <laughs> or points in the spatial configuration, and they give us the same tensor, you know, re regardless of what the point argument is, but the tensor itself is going to map reference configuration vectors to spatial configuration vectors. <clears throat> 
kind of <clears throat> maybe do this. Put in a little tangent in there since really f maps tangent vectors from reference to deformed and f inverse transpose maps uh, normal vectors from reference to spatial All right, so, so again, we have that f of point in the reference configuration, comma, time. Well, we can also do f of the fixed time inverse of the deformation and a spatial configuration point and time. Or we can go the other way. So that just means that, you know, we can describe these fields either way. And so we'll typically omit the arguments Now, while the distinction doesn't matter if we're just talking about <coughs> the field values at a point, um, you know, the distinction between reference configuration and spatial configuration, um, it does matter when we start talking about taking the spatial derivatives or partial derivatives with respect to time. So clearly, even though the background Euclidean space remains the same, the points occupied by the body at any given time versus the points occupied by the body in the reference configuration get all discombobulated by the deformation chi so that the gradient, say, of a scalar function phi taken with respect to the reference configuration body is not going to be the same as the gradient taken with respect to the points occupied by the body in the spatial configuration. So because of this, we'll denote the gradient divergence and curl taken in the reference configuration with NABLA or capital G grad, capital D div, and capital C curl. <coughs> So we'll say NABLA or capital G 
R-A-D grad. The textbook uses NABLA, um, and I'll try to use that to the greatest extent possible, but <clears throat> I've typically done this one. So if you see a capital G, know that it is the reference configuration. Capital D div and capital C curl. And their counterparts in the spatial configuration. Uh, we use lowercase letters for them, grad, div, and curl. Um, for either one, I never want to see that for div. or nabla cross for curl. Uh, the reason being that the gradient operator, while we can kind of treat it like a vector, if we have a fixed Cartesian frame and don't do anything, um, it does not transform as a vector. So the gradient operator is not a vector and it is really counterproductive to think of taking dot products and cross products with it. Um, the math of it works out, but it'll lead you astray if you use it in any other context other than a fixed Cartesian frame. And um, it really doesn't do anything useful to think of it that way um, because you can just remember or remember how to derive the formulas for them in coordinates the correct way. So don't do it. All right, so if we look at the, um, <clears throat> the ith component of the reference configuration gradient of a scalar function phi, so that would be reference configuration gradient of phi, which is a vector, <clears throat> we look at the ith component of it. This is the partial derivative of the scalar function phi with respect to reference configuration coordinate x, i. If we look at the ith component of the deformed configuration gradient, grad phi <coughs> sub i, this is equal to partial derivative of phi, kind of missed there. with respect to spatial configuration coordinate xi, which is equal to the partial derivative of phi. This is going to be the, uh, the chain rule here with respect to the reference configuration coordinate j times the partial derivative of the reference configuration coordinate j with respect to <clears throat> the spatial configuration coordinate i under the deformation. So we'll call that chi i, um, which is just giving the correspondence between your coordinates in the reference configuration and your conform yeah, coordinates in the deformed configuration under the action of the deformation. So in other words, following the material. All right, well, in coordinates, that is grad phi j, and then f inverse transpose ij. So the spatial gradient of a scalar field is equal to F inverse transpose times the reference configuration gradient or 
<coughs> you could have F transpose grad phi is equal to grad phi in the reference configuration. You can center those. All right, we can do the same thing with a vector field. So let's say we want to look at the ijth component of the spatial or deformed configuration gradient of a vector field G. Well, this is equal to partial GI, partial x, j, where x is the coordinate <coughs> in the deformed configuration. And so we can use the chain rule again. Got to go for the k here, since we're already using the j. And so that is the component form of grad G in the reference configuration, I, K, F inverse, K, J. And so we can say that the gradient of G in the spatial configuration is equal to the gradient of G in the reference configuration times F inverse. We can multiply through on the right hand side by F and the gradient of G in the spatial configuration times the deformation gradient is equal to the gradient of G in the reference configuration. <clears throat> Describing fields with respect to points in the reference configuration gives a Lagrangian description of motion while describing them with respect to points in the spatial configuration gives an Eulerian description of motion. Let's call that spatial configuration. They're synonyms, but <clears throat> the textbook tends to call it spatial, so try to avoid confusion. <clears throat> 
So when we're doing solid mechanics or beams, things like that, we'll tend to use a Lagrangian formulation. And when we're doing things like fluid mechanics, we'll tend to use an Eulerian description. Um, because fluids don't really care about their reference configuration too much, so it makes the most sense to talk about fluids as flowing through a region, not caring about how they started out or anything, whereas, you know, the stress in solids sort of cares entirely about how it is relative to the stress-free configuration. <clears throat> There's going to be two relevant ways of talking about the partial derivative with respect to time. Uh, one is going to be the partial derivative with respect to time following a material point. And that would give us, say, if we were to do that for the velocity, that would give us the proper acceleration, you know, the, the thing that force is going to <coughs> cause. And we'll denote that, the material time derivative, with a dot over the quantity of interest. So phi dot x in the reference configuration and t is equal to the partial derivative of phi x and t with respect to time holding reference configuration x fixed, <coughs> and the spatial time derivative will be phi prime x in the spatial configuration, and t is equal to partial derivative of phi with respect to spatial x and t, partial t, holding the spatial x fixed. <coughs> they are related in this way. So the time derivative following a material point of a point in the spatial configuration and time is equal to the partial time derivative holding the reference configuration point x fixed of phi times chi the deformation of that reference configuration point <coughs> and t comma t all of that evaluated for x equals the fixed time inverse which we'll denote this way for now, just chi inverse, understanding that that means for a fixed time of x and t. <coughs> All right, well, we know that um, the partial derivative of phi with respect to t holding the, or rather we can show, that the partial derivative with respect to time holding the reference configuration point fixed is equal to the partial derivative with respect to time holding the spatial 
configuration point fixed plus the gradient in the spatial configuration of phi. dotted with the partial derivative of our spatial position with respect to time, holding our <coughs> reference configuration point fixed. Well, so this part here is from way back in chapter three. Let's see if I can get you the equation number so that you know I didn't just pull that out of somewhere dark and smelly. Um, should have written that one down. We'll be on the section on gradient. If we were following a curve. Okay, yeah, so this is, um, if you look at 3.16 and include the possibility that phi is additionally a function of time. Um, So all that that one said was <clears throat> if phi wasn't a function of time and we were on some, you know, phi was a scalar field that was fixed in time and we move along some path through it, then uh, with a function x of t, then phi dot following our point was grad phi dot x dot. All right, so given that then, um, well, the time derivative of location for a fixed point in the reference configuration, that is the velocity. So in other words, we have um, phi dot is equal to phi prime, right, this one here is phi dot because it's for a fixed point in the reference configuration, and this is for phi prime because it's a fixed point in the spatial configuration, plus the spatial gradient, if I can spell, dot the velocity. <coughs> Give that a little important. All right. I can do the same thing for a vector field instead of a scalar field. So let's say g dot, the material time derivative of x and t is equal to partial g partial t fixed x in the spatial configuration, and then plus the gradient of g acting on partial spatial configuration x, partial time holding 
the reference configuration point fixed. So that's from the same <coughs> 3.16 sort of part of the textbook, equation 3.16, not section 3.16, uh, right around there. So at any rate, that is equal to g prime x and t plus grad g now instead of dot it is acting on the velocity all right so that gives us the time derivative of a vector field <coughs> following the material in terms of the partial derivative with respect to time at a fixed point and in space its gradient in the spatial or deformed configuration and the velocity so in particular, the material acceleration we'll say the acceleration of the material is, we'll say um, A is equal to V dot is equal to v prime plus grad v acting on v. <clears throat> and so this uh, nonlinear term here that arises, if you're doing, say, fluid mechanics or dynamics, you know, that is where an awful lot of your challenge comes into play because that's what makes it all nonlinear and nasty is the fact that you have grad v acting on v in your inertial term. The velocity gradient, grad v, <coughs> is uh, a spatial tensor field in that it maps spatial, right? Because it's the spatial gradient, it will take tangent vectors in the spatial configuration and give you the increment to velocity and the velocity is also a spatial vector so it maps spatial vectors to spatial vectors it's a spatial tensor field even though in terms of its you know distribution over the body you can take point arguments of reference configuration points or spatial configuration points it doesn't matter it just gives you the same tensor <clears throat> but we're going to use the velocity gradient a lot, um, specifically because of this relationship and, you know, this one. So we give it its own special symbol, and it'll be a capital letter L. It's a tensor field. So the velocity gradient is capital L, <coughs> defined as the spatial gradient of V. So for example, consider this. If we want the time derivative of the deformation gradient, Well, that is the partial derivative with respect to time, grad chi of x and t, evaluated at a fixed x. Well, if we're evaluating <coughs> the time derivative with a fixed reference configuration point, and then the gradient is taken in the reference configuration, then the time derivative and the gradient will commute. Just like if we took the time derivative with respect to a fixed spatial point and took the gradient in the spatial configuration 
the order of differentiation would commute. So this is equal to the gradient of chi dot. So chi dot is in for a fixed reference configuration point <coughs> of x and t. Well, that is the spatial configuration gradient of the velocity. And from our things way back up here, if I can get to it, right, we have this relation between the spatial and referential gradients. So here, oh, did I just call that the spatial? This is the referential gradient of velocity. So we can write that as the spatial one grad v times f. And so that is equal to l f. And on the right hand side, we have f dot. <clears throat> so that's a pretty useful formula for the time derivative of the deformation gradient in terms of the spatial velocity gradient and the deformation gradient itself. And uh, we can invert f. So we also have that L is equal to f dot f inverse. Now, uh, some things here to think of. We can't necessarily invert L because L could easily be zero, right? There might not be any gradient of the velocity. And f dot could easily be zero. So we can rely on being able to take f inverse, <coughs> but we can't rely on being able to take inverses of L or f dot in what's going to follow here. So since the velocity v is a spatial vector, and we already talked about this, I believe, L maps something to spatial vectors since it's the gradient of the velocity. So it's mapping something to increments in velocity. Um, and since it's the spatial gradient, it's mapping spatial displacements to spatial velocity increments. So it maps spatial vectors to spatial vectors. velocity increments. So L maps spatial vectors to spatial vectors and would be called a spatial tensor field. So the distinction here is um, when we're talking about a tensor field or a vector field being spatial or mixed or referential or material, um, it's not what the point arguments are because the point arguments, you know, 
the thing that makes it a field, it can just as easily take reference configuration points as it can tangent or blah, 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 spatial configuration points. The, um, the thing that distinguishes it between being a spatial, referential, or mixed vector or tensor field is the space that the vectors or tensors themselves live in. All right, well, the trace of L is equal to the trace of the spatial gradient of V by definition, and that by definition is the spatial divergence of the velocity. So let's remember back to section 3.3. <coughs> Uh, the time derivative of the determinant of a tensor is equal to the determinant of that tensor times the trace of the time derivative of that tensor times its own inverse. And so you know, that was just for a tensor function of a scale or variable. <clears throat> However, this also holds if we consider the dot to be the time derivative, the partial time derivative for a fixed material point. And, uh, you know, we, we could say that the tensor is F, the deformation gradient. So considering F the deformation gradient, And capital J, the volumetric Jacobian, defined as the determinant of F, we have that J dot is equal to J trace, well, F dot F inverse is L. And so that is equal to J times the spatial divergence of velocity. So the divergence of the velocity in the spatial configuration describes the rate of volumetric expansion. Now let's come up with another couple of useful identities. We already showed that F dot is equal to L F. Uh, so we can take the transpose of that and we have that F dot transpose is equal to F transpose L transpose. <coughs> we know that no matter what happens, F, F inverse is equal to the identity. And so if we take the time derivative of that, the time derivative of the identity is zero, and we can use the product rule and uh, move the two terms from the left-hand side, move one of them to the right-hand side, and you get F dot F inverse is equal to minus F 
times the time derivative of f inverse, which is distinct, right? So we can take the time derivative of f inverse. Um, we cannot necessarily take the inverse of the time derivative of f. So the two are not the same. <clears throat> That's why we put the big bar over the whole thing to say we're taking the time derivative of the inverse. All right, well, we can left multiply through by f inverse, and we get that the time derivative of the inverse of f is equal to minus f inverse f dot f inverse. And then remember that f dot f inverse is L, the velocity gradient. So this is equal to minus f inverse times the velocity gradient. <coughs> and we can take the transpose of that whole thing. Um, the time derivative of f inverse transpose is equal to minus L transpose f inverse transpose. So we had mentioned that <clears throat> partial derivative with respect to time and spatial differentiation commute as long as the time partial derivative is holding fixed the relevant um, spatial thing. So if we're taking our spatial derivatives with respect to the reference configuration, then the time derivative had better be taken holding the reference configuration point constant and vice versa, or they won't commute. So here we'll talk about commutator identities, which gives you kind of what the difference is if you mix and match. So we say that partial with respect to time holding x in the spatial configuration fixed and grad div curl in the spatial configuration, they commute. So do partial with respect to time holding reference configuration point fixed and reference configuration grad div curl. <coughs> On the other hand, um, you know, partial with respect to time of x, the reference configuration point, and spatial derivatives being taken in the deformed configuration, or time derivatives being taken holding spatial point fixed and your gradient divergence and curl being taken in the reference configuration, eh, not so much. So let's look at what the difference is. So the gradient of phi dot is equal to the gradient of phi prime plus v dot 
grad fee. We showed this a uh, little while back up here. Let's go find it. So we just substituted this relationship in for phi dot <clears throat> and expanded that out inside the gradient. Maybe we go and box off that uh, one for G while we're here, huh? All right, well, differentiation is linear, so we can split that up into grad phi prime plus grad v dot grad phi. Let's do that. It is equal to phi prime plus grad v dot grad phi. <clears throat> then we can use that um, identity that we had for the gradient of an inner product. And that is equal to grad phi prime plus, we'll call it grad squared. So the gradient of the gradient of phi transpose acting on V plus grad V transpose grad phi. So remember that the gradient of the gradient of a scalar field would be a tensor field, so it makes sense to take the transpose of it because the gradient of a scalar field is a vector field and the gradient of a vector field is a tensor field. All right. Well, grad V transpose, that's L transpose, so let's give ourselves a little shorthand. Plus. Okay, well, we also have that the time derivative <clears throat> of the spatial gradient of phi following a material point, right, so that's the material time derivative, well, that is equal to grad phi prime plus grad of grad phi acting on the velocity. And that goes back to, um, where'd that go? Why this very one right here? So we did that for the <clears throat> material time derivative of the whole shebang, giving you the spatial time derivative of the whole thing, just like that, and the gradient of it and V. All right, well, that is equal to grad phi prime plus grad squared phi v. And so if we combine this with what we had gotten right up here, then we get the gradient, the spatial gradient of phi dot, the material time derivative of it is equal to the material time derivative 
of the spatial gradient plus L transpose times the gradient. <clears throat> All right, if G is a vector field, so we're going to come up with the same thing, but now for a vector field instead of a scalar field. G is a vector field. And C is any constant vector Then let the scalar phi be defined as g dot c. <clears throat> so that phi dot is equal to g dot inner product c, since c dot is equal to 0. All right, well, in that case, the gradient the spatial gradient of the material time derivative of phi is equal to grad g dot transpose c. So this is coming from the identity for the gradient of an inner product. We are taking um, the gradient of this inner product. And then the gradient of C is, of course, 0. So there's only one term remaining. And the gradient of phi is equal to grad G transpose acting on C by the same logic. <coughs> All right, so in that case, We can move this whole thing to the left-hand side and then take the inner product of that with C. And that would have to be 0 dot C, you know, because we have the left-hand side minus the right-hand side dot C. So let's write that out. Grad material time derivative of g minus the material time derivative of the spatial gradient of g minus grad g again the spatial gradient times l whole mess transpose acting on c is equal to vector 0 for all c. <clears throat> all right, so that's going to give us, that can only be 0 for all c if uh, this whole thing here is tensor 0 all the time. is equal to the material time derivative. So this is the spatial gradient of the material time derivative is equal to the material time derivative of the spatial gradient plus the spatial gradient of that vector field acting on the velocity gradient. So we've shown the non-commutativity of crisscrossing material and spatial time and space derivatives. And we've explicitly given a formula for the difference that arises when you do it, in case uh, you ever find the need to do so, which we certainly will. All right, that's um, all that we have for this lecture. I'm going to post another homework assignment here soon post solutions to the third one as well. Catch up with you soon. Have a good one.